Hello, Internet! So nice to see you. Let's answer a few more of your music theory questions. Why is Hirajoshi so moving? I know why, but such heaviness. Well, Hirajoshi or Hirajoshi or however you want to pronounce it, it's, it's a different scale for different people because Hirajoshi or Hirajoshi is actually a tuning of a scale, but most people will call Hirajoshi this scale. So the a, a Hirajoshi will be A, B flat, D, E, F. So the whole thing sounds this way. And it's a very emotional scale. It has this kind of uh, absolute sadness to it. And it is so sad for a very specific music theoretical reason. And you want to know it so you can reuse it for other scales. Because the idea is this. You have... The, the skeleton of the scale is essentially uh, three notes. The first, what we would normally call first four, uh, one, four, and five, or first, fourth, and fifth of the scale. But in this case, of course, it doesn't apply because there are only five notes in the skeleton, but essentially the A, the D, the E. And as such, it looks a lot like a Western scale more than an Oriental scale because those are the same three degrees of the scale you would use in a blues, for instance, okay? So, nothing strange here, it's just uh, that the skeleton supporting the scale. And then, that's the genius part about it, there are two dissonances of a half step, one above the root, so A, B flat, and one above the fifth, so E, F. And it's those two half steps, those two semitones in the scale that gives all this kind of emotional impact to the scale. I mean, let me play the same thing, but rather than making those half step, I'm gonna make them full steps. I'm gonna play A, B, uh, D, E, F sharp. And now suddenly it's a happy scale because I transform all the half step into full steps, like so. Now it sounds like I'm major-ish pentatonic scale, it's not really a major pentatonic scale, but uh, sounds more major-ish, because again, no half-steps. And that, if you want, is the general rule, meaning in every scale, in every collection of notes, the drama is in the half-steps, because the half-steps are those dissonances, where the notes fight each other, and that's where the conflict, the emotion, comes from in the scale. So, whatever scale you have, if you really want to take out the emotion from the scale, see where the half steps are, and insist on those. Play them at the same time, play them one after another, those two notes. Uh, play around those half steps, it really brings up the emotion in any scale. So again, if you want a sound bite, the emotion is in the half step. Use it. So B flat is the seven dominant, not B. In the case of the C major scale, why am I confused if B is the seventh note and not B flat? You are confused because the seventh in the major scale is not a dominant seventh, it's a major seventh. So let me explain. The C major scale is C, D, E, F, G, A, B. You have a B, which is a major seventh, and simply because that's the way we define the major scale. It sounds good to us this way. The C does not have a dominant seventh. It just does not have it, because the dominant seventh will be B flat. If I can, if I want to, take the C major scale, eliminate the B note, which is the major seventh, and put instead a dominant seventh. And I'm gonna get this. And this is a perfectly legit scale. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a different scale. It's a C mixolydian scale, where again, you take the major scale, eliminate the major seventh, and put in the dominant seventh. See, the point of confusion is this. Just because the dominant seventh exists doesn't mean you need to have it in your scale. Some scales have a dominant seventh, some scales have a major seventh. Some chords have a dominant seventh, some chords have a major seventh. Okay, it's not that you need to have that specific interval. Thanks, great video. My question is, is the A flat a borrowed chord from the C minor scale, or is it something else? Here we are talking about the A flat chord in the context of a C major piece. So the idea is to play some chords on the C major. And then if somewhere slip in an A flat major, so it's gonna sound this way.
and it works unreasonably well for being a chord, not in key. I mean, it sounds really natural. <laughs> And right now, I'm just playing the triads, I'm just playing block bar chords, no voice leading to speak of, so I'm just literally throwing in this chord, and it works. So why it works? Well, the A-flat, that's the thing. Depending on what comes before and after, depending on a few other things, the E-flat, the A-flat, sorry, the A-flat could be different things, it could be explained in different ways. So if you just put in the triad, it's likely borrowed from minor. What does it mean? If I take the C minor scale, so I have the C major key and scale, if I take the C minor, I can take the chords from C minor and borrow them while I, while I play in major. And I cannot really do the opposite, uh, or at least it's harder to do the opposite. Your ear recognizes this uh, A flat as coming from C minor because you've learned to recognize the sounds by listening to a lot of music from where you were born. It's not innate, it's learned. Okay, and your ear interprets this A flat as being a kind of a sadder chord or more emotional chord into this uh, context of the C major scale. This would be true too if rather than I'm playing an A flat, you would play an A flat major seven. So if I'm playing uh, chords again, seven chords, I can have C major seven, F major seven. A flat major 7, and then uh, G7, I'll play it again. So again, your ear recognizes this chord as coming from minor because the A flat major 7 is from C minor. But uh, there's another kind of A flat chord that will sound different, is if you play an A flat dominant 7 instead, again it will still work, it will just sound different, so let me play the A flat dominant 7, so I have C major 7, F major 7, A flat dominant 7, G7, This A flat dominant 7 sounds different than before, and it sounds like a completely different thing because it is. It's indeed in this case, it's either an augmented sixth chord or a triton substitution of a secondary dominant. I know it's a long phrase. A secondary dominant, it's a dominant chord of a chord in the key. So in this case, you would have a secondary dominant of G7, the chord that comes after, it would be a D7. So my original chord progression will be. C major 7, F major 7, D7, G7, C. But the triton substitution of these will be C major 7, F major 7, A flat dominant 7, G dominant 7, C. Okay? It's not really as hard as it looks at first if you. Uh, want to study this stuff and, and you learn things in the right order, it's not really as hard. Thing is, this A flat could be two different things. So one is definitely emotional coming from minor, the other it's more kind of um, as a kind of a different feeling, kind of a um, jokester feeling for me, the, the Triton substitution. It feels more funny than sad, okay? If you want to learn all this stuff in the right order and make it easy for you, I do have a course called Complete Chord Mastery. Sorry for the shameless plug, but after all, this is a YouTube video and it's kind of a professional etiquette. I have to promote something every video I do. This is a totally random thought I had as I was watching this video. Why is it that guitar players refer to the string in the fret position as opposed to the string in the note when explaining fingering of chords? I feel like that's why most guitar players don't know the notes on the guitar neck. You will be right in thinking that most guitar players do not know the notes on the guitar. Let's say that most amateur players don't know the notes on the guitar. Most professional players, of course, do know all the notes. There is, though, a very specific reason to um, talk about the number of the fret as opposed to the note, and it's because we cannot really specify the octave of the note just by saying the note. For instance, if I'm telling you to play a G on the third string, well, this G could be the open string, G, but it can also be the G on the 12th fret. So, unless you want to specify the octave every time, but I don't think my, my, 
most people will like. Uh, play me a G3, mm. play me a G4, or things like that. It's going to be a bit confusing, especially because there are two different notations for the octave, the scientific notation, the Yamaha notation. And for one of them, uh, the middle C is C3, and for one of them, the middle C is C4. So it really doesn't make things, things easy to have this kind of two standard for everything we do. But that's why we just don't say the notes. Uh, sure, in some situation, you can figure out in what octave we are simply by the context. But, I mean, it's very natural to say, play the third string, open or play the third string at the 12th fret. It's much more natural to do it this way. For people who know their notes, it's obvious we are playing a G. For people who do not know their notes, they can still find the position and they can still follow along. So, again, quite natural for us guitar player to do this. And by the way, we are not the only one. Again, there were some um, uh, Baroque instruments, like the gambas, where they were using tablature and a similar system. And those instruments have frets, and so even if they're both instruments, they have frets. So it was very natural for them to refer and even to write songs down using this kind of tablature system and number of frets more than um, the notes per se. And uh, curiously enough, in their tablature system, they're not using numbers, they're using letters. So the first fret is A, the second fret is B, the third fret is C, which makes it really confusing for us today to understand the letters, but not all of them were using a letter system for the notes because many of them were using the name Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Si, Do or similar for the notes. So, yeah, you see, that, that's one thing about music theory. It's a simple idea. And then people come and they call the same thing in four different ways. And now we have to understand who's calling what, when and how, and it becomes incredibly complex. But the thing is, that's why I want to keep it simple. So when you talk with me, most of the time, I'm going to say that I'm going to play this string and this fret. And everybody can follow that, whether today or in 300 years. <laughs>